Hello there, all you expat wannabes. I'm Johnny Mueller, and you're listening to The Expat Files, Living in Latin America, the show that tells you just what it's like to live, work, play, and or retire down here in Latin America. It's a mix of the good, the bad, the ugly, and the great. And it's all right here, so let's get started. Let's get into it, starting with a virus update for Latin America. Every single day, I'm seeing Central American and Caribbean governments loosening up. Whereas South America is still pretty heavily locked down because the virus seems to have hit them five or six weeks later than the rest of the planet. So they're coming off their peak cases right now. Whereas in Central America, things are step by step getting back to normal. Or I shouldn't say normal because it's never going to be normal after this. Not anywhere in the world. For example, Karen writes, Johnny, do you wear a mask? And do you think we'll all be wearing masks from now on? The answer is yes, kind of. I wear a mask sometimes, if only to avoid other people's dirty looks. Who can you believe? Who can you believe? doesn't seem to matter what idiot experts say, because, as pointed out in many previous shows, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. (laughs) Whoa. So much for real science. I mean, there is real science, but people choose not to believe it. It doesn't fit their paradigm, or maybe it's too boring for them to listen to. I mean, hey, everybody's so addicted to anti-social media. They only seem to be able to absorb the latest sound bites. It seems like Big Pharma and related mega companies are in control now, at least as far as the lame street media. Thank Buddha we've got the alternative media. And now there is some backlash against guys like Bill Gates. Meanwhile, you've got YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and all the anti-social media platforms banning some real good, strong scientific information that doesn't fit their paradigm. I'm sure you've heard the stories about guys like Robert Kennedy Jr., He's a pretty strong anti-vaxxer with some very great points. You know, he's been banned and even, in some cases, completely erased from lamestream media. And why is that? Well, it's because Big Pharma hates the guy. I mean, look, it only stands to reason. Every third or fourth commercial you see on American TV is a promotion for some kind of pharmaceutical or drug. So, naturally, they can't have someone on a panel show laying down some scientific truths that'll harm their bottom line, but you knew that already. Hey, I'm not saying everything Kennedy says is correct. I'm just saying open up the debate. Give the guy a forum. But they won't. Now, he's not the only one who's been excommunicated from anti-social media platforms, but he's a good example. Meanwhile, if you're walking down the street or just doing your daily exercise, running, jogging, power walking, whatever, and you're not wearing a mask, you're really going to take some heat. You might even get fined, even though... All, and I'm talking all the scientific evidence, points to the fact that the one place you're least likely to pick up the virus is out in the fresh air. Duh. But you knew that already, too. So, yes, when I'm out and about, I do wear a mask, if only to avoid other people's dirty looks, and they won't let you into the grocery store without one. Meanwhile, while I'm standing in the checkout line, the guy in front of me has got five loaves of Wonder Bread, various three-liter jumbo packs of Diet Coke, assorted bags of Cheetos, pork rinds, and Frosted Flakes, a couple of gallon jugs of palm seed vegetable oil, yum yum, and a carton of cigarettes. And of course, the guy's huffing and puffing because he's something like 70 pounds overweight, but he's wearing a mask and latex gloves that I can tell he's been wearing for hours and hours. Because, you know, after a while, they get all sweaty inside and start sticking to you. They've got that way too moist, saturated glove look, you know what I mean? Talk about uncomfortable. Talk about unsanitary. You imagine how much bacteria is growing inside those things? You know, after about an hour of wearing latex gloves, you got a human Petri dish going there. Oh, and about social distancing. That reminds me of a 17th century book on the subject. Now, what, you might ask, would I be doing reading from a 17th century book? The thing is, I've always had a habit of reading everything, including labels on Drano, Mr. Clean, and douche bottles whilst lounging in the john. And one time, not so long ago, I don't know where I found it, on the internet somewhere, of course, there was a British book from the 17th century called, get this, 116 Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior in Company and Conversation. I you not. There's an actual 17th century manual for gentlemen and ladies, of course, who bothered to pick it up and read it, though back then society was macho and geared toward males. It's a manual for gentlemen with 110 rules for fashionable young men in social settings and drawing rooms. Hmm, have you been in a drawing room lately? I don't think I've ever been in one. I think only on Masterpiece Theater do drawing rooms exist and in Jane Austen novels. So then, what are you supposed to do in a drawing room? Draw? Draw what? 
So anyway, there is this actual book with 110 social maxims from the 17th century, and you got to see it or read it to believe it. For example, number four says, in the presence of others, sing not to yourself with a humming noise, nor drum your fingers or feet. <laughs> I guess that's strike number one for me because I'm one of those foot tappers. <laughs> oh, and number 11 says, shift not yourself in the sight of others, nor gnaw at your nails. <laughs> Also good advice. Not a nail gnar myself. How about you? Oh, and here's number 12. Spew in no man's face with your spittle by approaching too near him when you speak. <laughs> hmm, why don't mothers teach us those things? Maybe they did. Did yours? Well, you know what? 300 years ago, that was a really well-phrased opinion on social distancing, wasn't it? Oh, and how about number 100? It says, cleanse not your teeth with a tablecloth napkin, fork, or knife. But if others do it, let it be done clandestinely with a pick tooth. Yeah, pick tooth. But really, it's number 37 on that list that we've all completely forgotten up till now, till the virus thing. It says, in speaking to men of quality, do not lean or look them full in the face, nor approach them too near. At least keep a full pace from them. Hey, now, that just might be the world's first written rule of social distancing, written in a 17th century etiquette book. Of course, back then, you know, they had yellow fever, smallpox, polio, diphtheria, major BO and halitosis issues, too. You can sort of see why those rules existed for ladies and gentlemen, of course. Which brings us full circle back to the lunatic rules of the 21st century corona thing. Where, once again, I repeat, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. Take so-called essential services. Liquor stores are essential, but AA meetings are not. Walmart's essential, but farmers' markets aren't. Duh. Subways are essential, but churches? Forget about it. Meanwhile, my grandma always said you eat a pound of dirt a year, or was it a quart of Roundup? The question is, what's wrong with everyone? We let idiot, moron politicians and bureaucrats tell us what is and what is not essential. Why not? They're not out of work. They still get paid. Even if they shut down a government building, they get their checks as usual. And the rest of society, people who actually make a product that you use and consume, were forced to follow the crap spewed by these dipshits. You got lard-ass government shit for brains telling us what is and what isn't good for us? I say, hang them all. And if they don't go to work, they're in the same boat as the rest of us. To anyone with a half a brain, you can see the U.S. government and all government reactions are out of control. Or at least schizophrenic. Kind of like out of the pages of Orwell or an Ayn Rand novel. Yeah, it's Ayn. It's not Anne. Yep, now everyone can see that the government is everywhere and it's got its hands and face everywhere too. Problem is, it's all very unnatural, you know, except in communist, socialist, and dictatorial regimes. And we kind of know how that ends, don't we? And the only answer from government and the lamestream media is more and more government. More stimulus, too, as if there'll never be a day of reckoning. Well, I'll tell you, that's just rocket fuel for gold, silver, and Bitcoin, you know. The question is, why are so-called experts consistently wrong? Even the smartest guy in the room is wrong sometimes, you know. Look, you could have the best hand at poker, too, and still lose, right? And for all you guys out there thinking, even saying, the economy will bounce back, man... Let me put it this way. The economy is like Elvis in his final fat and drugged years, and the Fed is like Elvis's doctor. Meanwhile, the fake news just keeps on coming, and some of it, you know, sounds reasonable. Look, even the biggest lie has to have a grain of truth in it or people won't bite. For example, speaking of Latin America and what you've been hearing in the lamestream media, they're saying, for example, more than 90% of intensive care beds were filled last week in Chile's capital, Santiago. We're talking South America now, where the peak is lagging the rest of the world by about six weeks. Anyway, so they're saying that 90% of intensive care beds were full last week in Chile's capital, Santiago. Wow, that sounds horrendous, doesn't it? That means hospitals have very little wiggle room, or so it would seem, except how many beds is that actually? Typically... Intensive care units have less than 10% of a hospital's beds. In other words, if your local hospital has 100 beds, they probably have less than 10 ICU beds. 
Meanwhile, you have to take into consideration that almost no hospital in the world right now is permitting elective surgeries like boob and nose jobs, liposuction, and hip replacements. That means automatically hospitals are less than 50% occupied because the typical hospital is half filled with elective surgeries. But back to Santiago, Chile. There are 17 hospitals in Santiago. And on average, each hospital has around 150 regular beds and six ICU beds. That's a fact. You can look it up. But let's be real generous and say that each one of those 17 hospitals has 20 ICU beds. That's 340 ICU beds in the whole city of Santiago. And 90% of 340 is 310 beds filled with patients of all types admitted to the ICU based on the data I gave you at the beginning of this spiel where it was said in a lamestream media article that last week, the third week in May, 90% of the ICU units in Santiago, Chile are filled. So let's say two-thirds of those beds are COVID patients. That makes about 200 cases of COVID patients in the ICUs in a city of 7 million people. You know, that's less than a drop in the bucket. Or as a mathematician would tell you, that's not even enough to be a rounding error. But no, you won't hear that on the news or in print. They'll tell you that 90% of the ICU beds are full, making it seem like the end is coming. Everyone's in a panic. Instead of saying the rest of the hospital's half full and that the cases we do have in the ICUs comprise 0.000028% of our entire city's population. Or to put it another way, one out of every 35,000 residents of our city is in the ICU with COVID virus. But, you know, that's not very alarming news, so they spin it. Hey, whatever it takes to grab a headline. But to make it out like the second coming of the Black Plague, that's pure BS. Of course, that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. But facts are facts, and your facts can't be different than my facts. Then again, why don't these articles and news pieces compare those stats with similar USA stats? What's it now in the States? Around 100,000 deaths, right? And we're hearing reports that almost every death in a hospital is called a corona death. Why? Because, according to USA Today, a straightforward garden variety pneumonia that a person is admitted to the hospital for, Medicaid will typically pay the lump sum of 5000 bucks to the hospital. But if it's a COVID-19 pneumonia, then they get 13000 bucks. And if they slap a ventilator on you, it automatically goes up to 39000 bucks. I'm sure you've all heard about that scam. Meanwhile, last week in Quito, Ecuador, the daily deaths jumped from 114 to 209, while in the States, the deaths were at 2,000 a day. Nice try, lame street media. Oh, and you've been hearing all over the news about airlines going bankrupt around the world, right? Let's see just who's filed bankruptcy or who's on the edge of it. Almost all are, get this, government-run airlines. And those private ones that are on the edge of going under are heavily subsidized by governments, too. Then there's that little matter of their stock buybacks, but we won't get into that here. You know, almost all major countries have their own government-supported airline. They're highly inefficient loss leaders, too. You know, in a true capitalist system, inefficient ones should go bankrupt. Oh, and there's another thing you almost never hear spoken about when it comes to bankrupt airlines. They don't ever really go away. They just get absorbed by stronger airlines who buy them for pennies on the dollar. For example, Avianca, which is Columbia's airline, just went bankrupt. It's not going to stop flying. It's got some very valuable routes. And whoever buys Avianca probably won't even repaint the planes. Just like when Harley Davidson filed for bankruptcy and got bought out by Brunswick. They never quit producing Harleys. Same thing with Jaguars. You know, they went bankrupt and got bought by Chrysler. Still, Jaguars get produced every year. But they're really a Chrysler product. <laughs> but with the public... Jaguars still have kind of a 007 cachet, you know, even though Bond never drove one. And you probably didn't know that Fender Guitar, one of the world's biggest guitar makers, was bought out after they declared bankruptcy by CBS in the 1970s. Yet the making of Fender guitars did not skip a beat. So when you hear that all these airlines are going under, cruise lines for that matter too, don't panic. Departments will be streamlined and people will get laid off. But don't worry, you'll still be able to take a cruise and fly and probably at a cheaper rate, too. You know, even with the airline's social distancing rules, in fact, I'm checking the cheapo airline site right now, and they're showing air flights for half of what they were about a year ago. Bottom line here is that you have to realize whatever the government runs, if evaluated and measured by traditional sound and logical business practice norms, 
It's always a losing proposition and would never survive for a minute on its own. Government projects, and I mean every single one of them, without a constant, massive injection of money down those black holes, they wouldn't survive. Now, I actually like the idea of national health care, but no one practiced it to be a surefire, extremely large black hole disaster like the post office, the VA, Obamacare, the Department of Education, the military, even NASA. You know, people sometimes point to NASA and say, what a great organization it is. It's one of the examples where the U.S. government has actually done something right. And the secondary effects of research are spectacular. That's the PR anyway. But you know what? In a past life, I was an engineer and I have lots and lots of engineering buddies. In fact, one of them who is head of the Canadian Space Agency. I bet you didn't even know they had one. Well, you know, they made the arm for the space station. You know, that big thing that looks like a backhoe in space. Nevertheless, no matter what you've heard on TV or in the press or in op-ed pieces, every engineer close to it will tell you NASA is as bloated and bureaucratic as any black hole government program. It's just loaded with lard. And all the secondary technologies that have come out of NASA research would have come out years sooner and infinitely cheaper if the space industry was opened up to privatization. And you might think, you know, since it's so expensive to shoot rockets into space, no private agency had the backing of the funds. Well, that's not true. The fact is, until just a few years ago, it was illegal for a private company to run its own space program in competition with NASA. But now that NASA doesn't make any big rockets anymore, they have to farm out their rocket engines to private companies. Like, for example, Elon Musk's SpaceX. And man, have they proved what a horrible business plan NASA's been running. Did you know that SpaceX rockets cost one-tenth as much as the very same rockets that go the very same distance and do the very same thing as NASA-built rockets? Of course, they don't really build them. They farm them out to big defense contractors like Boeing and Hughes Aircraft and General Dynamics at cost plus. You know what that means, don't you? You give a bid on something like the space shuttle or a rocket booster. The government accepts it. You start building the thing. The deadline comes and goes, but it's not done. But the bills keep rolling in and the government just pays them. That's what the cost plus is. It's always been an open checkbook for defense contractors. That's the way it is. You knew that already, right? That's why I think national health care is a great idea, because then you can get rid of the stinking insurance companies and all the tens of thousands of useless administrators. But to let the government run it? Based on their history, it's insane to think they won't completely screw it up. Oh, and speaking of Latin American airline bankruptcy, you've got Ecuador's largest commercial carrier filing for bankruptcy. It's called LATAM. Two weeks after Avianca filed for bankruptcy, which is the Colombian government airline, following on the heels of another Ecuadorian airline called TAME Airlines, T-A-M-E Airlines. Still, those airlines will fly, but the routes that aren't making money for them will definitely be cut back. Meanwhile, I've been checking the prices for air flights with some of the consolidators like Cheapo Air and Obits, Expedia. And in many cases, prices have hit rock bottom. So for the short term anyway, we can expect airline prices to bottom out drastically, at least in the next couple of months. Not to mention, you'll probably have a big chunk of the airplane to yourself, at least the row you're sitting in. By the way, did you see this brand new CDC report, Center for Disease Control? It came out on May 26, and it should be earth-shattering to the narrative of the lamestream media and the political classes, but it probably won't be widely disseminated. It says, for the first time, they've offered a real estimate of the overall death rate for COVID-19. Turns out, under the most likely scenario, the CDC is estimating that people who are symptomatic will have a fatality rate of 0.4%, or less than one-half of 1%. That means in real terms, if you have full-blown symptoms, your chances of dying are about 1 in 250. It's not a 5, 10, or 20% fatality rate, as you might have heard, but a 0.4%. The article says, until now, people have been ridiculed for thinking the death rate was very low, as opposed to the 3.4% estimate of the World Health Organization, which helped drive the panic and the lockdowns. Now, the CDC is saying that the rate is not. 3.4% like the WHO says, the WHO, another nasty Bill Gates-funded organization, as we all know. So the death rate is not 3.4%, or 34 dead out of 1,000 afflicted, but a 0.4% mortality rate, which is four people dead for every 1,000 people with symptoms. And if you think about it, it's probably a lot less than that. Remember, there are people dying of other causes all the time. 
And if they test positive for corona, it's written on their death certificate. So again, we're back to the conundrum that for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. Not to mention, WHO is a known hotbed of special interest in corruption, with Bill Gates steering the rudder on that ship. And we all know Big Pharma's got its hooks in the CDC, too. So who do you trust when all you've got is idiots and morons in charge? The only smart thing to do is to get a plan B and get the hell out of Dodge. And your best way to get your plan B in high gear, even on steroids, is to come to my Expat Insider Seminar. As this show goes out, the next one kicks off in about three months. We expect all first world and third world airports to be open. In fact, down here in Central America and the Caribbean, the airports are open. So our seminar will be partly in Guatemala's Altiplano, 6,000 feet above sea level, where the weather is spring-like all year round. And we'll also be spending some of our time in the adjacent country of El Salvador in the lowland tropics and Pacific Beach area. So come on down and drink from the fire hose while you still can. Because believe me, now that the everything bubble has been popped, Uncle Sam and first world countries especially will not be happy to see the sheep leave the barn. Remember, they're all bankrupt. They're beyond bankrupt. So there'll be other restrictions and travel barriers to try to keep you, your ass, and your assets from leaving the country. Just remember, the U.S. money supply has doubled in just the last three months. There's never been such an increase in all the history of the U.S. or the world. It will have to be paid back somehow. And how do you think they're going to do it? Through taxes and massive inflation. Heavily indebted governments love inflation because what they borrow will be paid back in cheaper dollars later. There's something really wrong with that system, where the little guy always gets creamed. You still have a chance to get out, you know. So come on down to the seminar. You'll meet all the right people and the necessary connections to get your plan B rolling. Don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have to. Come on down and see how my little group of expats have been doing it. For info and sign-up details, just go to expatplanb.com. All right. Now an email from Kurt in Puerto Rico. Hey, old Johnny. You mentioned your new discovery of the Titan all-in-one solar units a few episodes back. I recall you were going to go into more depth in future episodes on the subject. Tell me, am I on something or onto something. Also, Johnny, seems you are quite the do-it-yourself guy. My dad was like that too, but I only paid partial attention growing up. I can do the usual suspect stuff like oil changes, brakes, minor house repairs. No problem, but it's not my number one hobby. Question is, Johnny, how do guys you know with similar skill levels such as mine or less close that gap? Personally, he says, I'm worried about gringo pricing or subpar work that I don't yet have the experience to notice. That said, I might see you in August at the seminar. Signed, Kurt in Puerto Rico. Yeah, Kurt, you're right. I found a great new portable solar system that's just fantastic. Though it is a bit costly, but that's because you can add to it. You can stack on batteries and work it up to a full-scale, permanent, off-the-grid system if you like. You know, the latest thing, the latest trend is to have a complete all-in-one solar system. That means instead of a half dozen parts, you have everything in one little box. Batteries, controllers, converters, everything factory wired in the box. Then all you do is run a couple of 10 or 8 gauge wires out to your solar panels, hook them up, and you're in business. You're producing power all day and storing it in your battery for use at night. Now, of course, you know there's all kinds of information on the internet about solar systems, and those systems, especially the do-it-yourself systems, are pretty complicated, at least for the average guy who doesn't know much about electricity. And, you know, just up to the past maybe year and a half, you had to buy a separate controller, converter, batteries, combiner box. They had to be compatible, getting the wattage, voltage, and current to match. You see, that's not necessary anymore. And if anybody tries to sell you a system with multiple parts, even though it might have been manufactured six months ago, it's old agent technology. Yep, they're still making all that stuff. Don't go for it. Unless, of course, you are a true do-it-yourselfer and you might like to tinker and put that stuff together because you can save some money. It is a lot of extra work, and the all-in-one units, they've got a complete guarantee. The thing is, if you buy an all-in-one unit, everything's completely balanced and compatible. So anyway, what I'm recommending now for the best portable system out there, that is if you've got extra dough because it's not that cheap, is the all-in-one Titan system. You could put together a really, really nice portable system for around three to four grand. And later, if you want to, you can buy extra batteries that stack right on top of the thing. You can make it portable or permanent. However, if you haven't got that kind of dough, you can buy a really good portable system for around half that much. But it's not stackable. 
That's the portable system I have right now. It's an all-in-one system from Power Oak, though you can find the same system rebranded with other names. You could buy it straight from Amazon or Alibaba or direct from the factory, and then you get a huge discount, a little more than half price. But then you have to arrange the overseas shipping, and you have to wire transfer them the money because they don't take credit cards or PayPal. Now, you probably remember a few weeks ago I was talking about a system that just came out. It's a Tesla Powerwall clone system. It does exactly what the Tesla system does, but it's at half the price or less. It's from a company called Best Sun, not a China, of course. And believe it or not, they're now selling them on Amazon. They're all in one Powerwall. It's around 4000 bucks, and Tesla's around 10 But of course, with both of those systems, you'll need to have solar panels and mount them and such. Anyway, with both of the systems I'm talking about, you don't have to know anything really about electricity or electronics because they're all in one package, as mentioned. By the way, Kurt was saying, what happens when you come down to Latin America and you're not really too much of a do-it-yourselfer? You don't want to get gouged or have substandard work done. Well, you know, Kurt, we're so lucky we have YouTube because you can see installations of all kinds done perfectly fine on YouTube. It's absolutely the best tool and the best school out there. And you know, when it comes to solar power, setting up the unit, mounting your panels and all that, you can find a YouTube that'll explain everything to you step by step. You'll be able to see people in action doing the exact same setup that you'll need to do. And that goes for pretty much any kind of repair and construction around the house. Always do a YouTube search and look at a couple of videos. In English, of course. I'm not recommending you look at the version in Spanish. That won't help you if you don't speak the language. Though many of the do-it-yourself YouTubes are in Spanish too. And I just don't mean clicking on the Spanish subtitles either. I mean they're actually done in Latin America by Spanish-speaking locals. YouTube in Spanish has caught on down here. They've got everything covered. Oh, and another thing, Kurt, if you come down to my Expat Insider Seminar, you'll meet a bunch of gringos and expats who've been living down here a long, long time. That means if and when you move down, all you have to do is check with one of your new buddies before you get started with any project or repair. They'll give you the heads up on gringo pricing and gouging and what you should expect. And finally, for everyone out there who's looking to go solar, whether it's portable or a permanent installation, going off the grid, etc., just send me an email, files at gmail.com. I'll give you my latest, greatest, very up-to-date picks on those solar systems I was just talking about. I've got some very excellent and detailed information for you, so drop me a line. South of the border, You've been listening to The Expat Files, Living in Latin America. If you need some help with your own Plan B, we can schedule a one-on-one phone or Skype consult. Just send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. And if you want to get on the waiting list for my next week-long expat insider seminar in Central America, where you're guaranteed to get a two- to five-year head start on your Plan B, send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. Nos vemos.